Hey, thrilling suspense fanatics. This week's story is one in a familiar setting, but also one that I speculate you may not be familiar with. We all know about Earthsea, Ged, the creatures he faced, but this little-known tale helped to introduce the setting as Ursula K. Le Guin was inventing it herself. It's called The Rule of Names by Ursula K. Le Guin. Mr. Underhill came out from under his hill, smiling and breathing hard. Each breath shot out of his nostrils as a double puff of steam, snow-white in the morning sunshine. Mr. Underhill looked up at the bright December sky and smiled wider than ever, showing snow-white teeth. Then he went down to the village. "'Morning, Mr. Underhill,' said the villagers as he passed them in the narrow street between houses with conical overhanging roofs like fat red caps of toadstools. "'Morning, morning,' he replied to each. It was, of course, bad luck to wish anyone a good morning. A simple statement of the time of day was quite enough in a place so permeated with influences as Saturn's Island, where a careless adjective might change the weather for a week. All of them spoke to him, some with affection, some with affectionate disdain. He was all the little island had in the way of a wizard, and so deserved respect. But how could you respect a fat little man of fifty who waddled along with his toes turned in, breathing steam and smiling? He was no great shakes as a workman, either. His fireworks were fairly elaborate, but his elixirs were weak. Warts he charmed off frequently reappeared after three days. Tomatoes, he enchanted, grew no bigger than cantaloupes. And those rare times when a strange ship Stopped at Satin's Harbor, Mr. Underhill always stayed under his hill, for fear, he explained, of the evil eye. He was, in other words, a wizard the way wall-eyed Gan was a carpenter, by default. The villagers made do with badly hung doors and inefficient spells for this generation, and relieved their annoyance by treating Mr. Underhill quite familiarly, as a mere fellow villager. They even asked him to dinner. Once he asked some of them to dinner, and served a splendid repast, with silver, crystal, damask, roast goose, sparkling andrades, 639, and plum pudding with hard sauce. But he was so nervous all through the meal that it took the joy out of it. And besides, everybody was hungry again half an hour afterwards. He did not like anyone to visit his cave, not even the anteroom, beyond which, in fact, nobody had ever got. When he saw people approaching the hill, he always came trotting out to meet them. "'Let's sit out here, under the pine trees,' he would say, smiling and waving towards the fir grove. "'Or, if it was raining, let's go have a drink at the inn, eh?' Though everyone knew he drank nothing stronger than well water." Some of the village children, teased by that locked cave, poked and pried and made raids while Mr. Underhill was away. But the small door that led into the inner chamber was spell-shut, and it seemed for once to be an effective spell. Once a couple of boys, thinking that the wizard was over on the west shore, curing Miss Runa's sick donkey, brought a crowbar and a hatchet up there, but at the first whack of the hatchet on the door there came a roar of wrath from inside and a cloud of purple steam. Mr. Underhill had got home early. The boys fled. He did not come out, and the boys came to no harm, though they said you couldn't believe what a hooting, howling, hissing, horrible bellow that fat little man could make unless you'd heard it. His business in town this day was three dozen fresh eggs and a pound of liver. Also a stop at Sea Captain Fogeno's cottage to renew the seeing charm on the old man's eyes, quite useless when applied to a case of detached retina, but Mr. Underhill kept trying. And finally, a chat with old Goody Gold, the concertina-maker's widow. 
Mr. Underhill's friends were mostly old people. He was timid with the strong young men of the village, and the girls were shy of him. He makes me nervous. He smiles so much, they all said, pouting, twisting silky ringlets round a finger. Nervous was a new-fangled word, and their mothers all replied grimly, Nervous my foot. Silliness is the word for it. Mr. Underhill is a very respectable wizard. After leaving Goody Gold, Mr. Underhill passed by the school, which was being held this day out on the common. Since no one on Satin's Island was literate, there were no books to learn to read from, and no desks to carve initials on, and no blackboards to erase, and, in fact, no schoolhouse. On rainy days the children met in the loft of the communal barn, and got hay in their pants. On sunny days the schoolteacher, Palani, took them anywhere she felt like. Today, surrounded by thirty interested children under twelve and forty uninterested sheep under five, she was teaching an important item on the curriculum, the rule of names. Mr. Underhill, smiling shyly, paused to listen and watch. Palani, a plump, pretty girl of twenty, made a charming picture there in the wintry sunlight, sheep and children around her, a leafless oak above her, and behind her the dunes and sea and clear pale sky. She spoke earnestly, her face flushed pink by wind and words. Now you know the rule of names already, children. There are two, and they're the same on every island in the world. What's one of them? It ain't polite to ask anyone what his name is, shouted a fat, quick boy, interrupted by a little girl shrieking. You can't never tell your own name to somebody, my ma says. Yes, Suba, yes, Poppy dear, don't screech, that's right. You never ask anybody his name, you never tell your own. Now think about that a minute and tell me why we call our wizard Mr. Underhill. She smiled across the curly heads and the woolly backs at Mr. Underhill, who beamed and nervously clutched his sack of eggs. "'Cause he lives under a hill,' said half the children. "'But is it his true name?' "'No,' said the fat boy, echoed by a little poppy shrieking. "'No!' "'How do you know it is not?' "'Cause he came here all alone, and so there wasn't anybody knew his true name, so they couldn't tell us, and he couldn't.' "'Very good, Suba. Poppy, don't shout. That's right. Even a wizard can't tell his true name. When you children are through school and go through the passage, you'll leave your child names behind and keep only your true names, which you must never ask for and never give away. Why is that the rule? The children were silent. The sheep bleated gently. Mr. Underhill answered the question. Because the name is the thing, he said in his shy, soft, husky voice, and the true name is the true thing. To speak the name is to control the thing. Am I right, schoolmistress? She smiled and curtsied, evidently a little embarrassed by his participation, and he trotted off towards his hill, clutching his eggs to his bosom. Somehow the minutes spent watching Polani and the children had made him very hungry. He locked his inner door behind him with a hasty incantation, but there must have been a leak or two in the spell, for soon the bare anteroom of the cave was rich with the smell of frying eggs and sizzling liver. The wind that day was light and fresh out of the west, and on it at noon a little boat came skimming the bright waves into Satin's harbor. Even as it rounded the point a sharp-eyed boy spotted it, and knowing, like every child on the island, every sail and spar of the forty boats of the fishing fleet, he ran down the street, calling out, A foreign boat! A foreign boat! Very seldom was the lonely isle visited by a boat from some equally lonely isle of the East Reach, or an adventurous trader from the archipelago. 
but by the time the boat was at the pier half the village was there to greet it and the fishermen were following it homewards, and cowherds and clam-diggers and herb-hunters were puffing up and down all the rocky hills, heading towards the harbour. But Mr. Underhill's door stayed shut. There was only one man aboard the boat. Old Sea Captain Fogano, when they told him that, drew down a bristle of white brows over his unseeing eyes. "'There's only one kind of man.' he said, that sails the outer reach alone, a wizard, a warlock, or a mage. So the villagers were breathless, hoping to see for once in their lives a mage, one of the mighty white magicians of the rich, towered, crowded inner islands of the archipelago. They were disappointed, for the voyager was quite young, a handsome black-bearded fellow who hailed them cheerfully from his boat, and leaped ashore like any sailor glad to have made port. He introduced himself at once as a sea peddler, but when they told Sea Captain Fogano that he carried an oaken walking stick around with him, the old man nodded. Two wizards in one town, he said. Bad! and his mouth snapped shut like an old carp's. As the stranger could not give them his name, they gave him one right away. Blackbeard. And they gave him plenty of attention. He had a small mixed cargo of cloth and sandals and pea-sweet feathers for trimming cloaks and cheap incense, and levity stones and fine herbs and great glass beads from Venway, the usual peddler's lot. Everyone on Saturn's island came to look, to chat with the voyager, and perhaps to buy something. "'Just to remember him by,' cackled Goody Gould, who, like all the women and girls of the village, was smitten with Blackbeard's bold good looks. All the boys hung around him, too, to hear him tell of his voyages to far strange islands of the Reach, or to describe the great rich islands of the archipelago, the inner lanes, the roadsteads white with ships, and the golden roofs of Havnor. The men willingly listened to his tales, but some of them wondered why a trader should sail alone, and kept their eyes thoughtfully upon his oaken staff. But all this time Mr. Underhill stayed under his hill. "'This is the first island I've ever seen that had no wizard.' said Blackbeard one evening to Goody Gould, who had invited him and her nephew and Polani in for a cup of rush-wash tea. What do you do when you get a toothache or the cow goes dry? Why, we've got Mr. Underhill, said the old woman. For what it's worth, muttered her nephew Bert, and then blushed purple and spilled his tea. Bert was a fisherman, a large, brave, wordless young man. He loved the schoolmistress, but the nearest he had come to telling her of his love was to give baskets of fresh mackerel to her father's cook. "'Oh, you do have a wizard?' Blackbeard asked. "'Is he invisible?' "'No, he's just very shy,' said Polani. "'You've only been here a week, you know, and we see so few strangers here.' She also blushed a little, but did not spill her tea." Blackbeard smiled at her. He's a good satinsman, then, eh? No, said Goody Gould. No more than you are. Another cup, Nevy. Keep it in the cup this time. No, my dear. He came in a little bit of a boat four years ago, was it? Just a day after the end of the shad run, I recall, for they were taking up the nets over in East Creek, and Pondy Cowherd broke his leg that very morning. Five years ago it must be. No, four. No, five it is. Twas the year the garlic didn't sprout. So he sails in on a bit of a sloop loaded full up with great chests and boxes and says to see Captain Fogano, who wasn't blind then, I hear tell, he says, you've got no wizard nor warlock at all. Might you be wanting one? Indeed, if the magic's white, says the captain, and before you could say cuttlefish, Mr. Underhill had settled down in the cave under the hill and was charming the mange off Goody Belto's cat, though the fur grew in gray and twas an orange cat. Queer-looking thing it was after that. 
It died last winter in the cold spell. Goody Belto took on so at that cat's death, poor thing, worse than when her man was drowned on the long banks. The year of the long herring runs, when Nevy Bert here was but a babe in petticoats. Here Bert spilled his tea again, and Blackbeard grinned, but Goody Gould proceeded undismayed and talked on till nightfall. The next day Blackbeard was down at the pier, seeing after the sprung board in his boat which he seemed to take a long time fixing, and as usual drawing the taciturn satinsmen in to talk. Now, which of these is your wizard's craft? he asked. Or has he got one of those the mages fold up into a walnut shell when they're not using it? Nay, said a stolid fisherman. She's oop in his cave under hill. He carried the boat when he came in up to his cave. Ay, clear oop, I helped. Heavier as lead she was, full oop with great boxes, and they full up books and spells, he says. Heavier as lead she was. And then the stolid fisherman turned his back, sighing stolidly. Goody Gould's nephew, mending a net nearby, looked up from his work and asked with equal stolidity, Would you like to meet Mr. Underhill, maybe? Blackbeard returned Bert's look. Clever black eyes met candid blue ones for a long moment. Then Blackbeard smiled and said, Yes, will you take me up to the hill, Bert? Ay, when I'm done with this, said the fisherman. And when the net was mended, he and the archipelagans set off up the village street towards the high green hill above it. But as they crossed the common, Blackbeard said, Hold on a while, friend Bert. I have a tale to tell you before we meet your wizard. Tell away, says Bert, sitting down in the shade of a live oak. It's a story that started a hundred years ago and isn't finished yet, though it soon will be, very soon. In the very heart of the archipelago, where the islands crowd thick as flies on honey, there's a little isle called Pendor. The sea lords of Pendor were mighty men in the old days of war before the League. Loot and ransom and tribute came pouring into Pendor, and they gathered a great treasure there long ago. Then from somewhere away out in the west reach, where dragons breed on the lava isles, came one day a very mighty dragon. Not one of those overgrown lizards most of you outer reach folk call dragons, but a big, black, winged, wise, cunning monster, full of strength and subtlety, and, like all dragons, loving gold and precious stones above all things, he killed the Sea Lord and his soldiers, and the people of Pendor fled in their ships by night. They all fled away and left the dragon coiled up in Pendor Towers, and there he stayed for a hundred years, dragging his scaly belly over the emeralds and sapphires and coins of gold, coming forth only once in a year or two when he must eat. He'd raid nearby islands for his food. You know what dragons eat. Bert nodded and said in a whisper, Maidens. Right, said Blackbeard. Well, that couldn't be endured forever nor the thought of him sitting on all that treasure. So after the League grew strong, and the archipelago wasn't so busy with wars and piracy, it was decided to attack Pendor, drive out the dragon, and get the gold and jewels for the treasury of the League. They're forever wanting money, the League is, so a huge fleet gathered from fifty islands, and seven mages stood in the prows of the seven strongest ships, and they sailed towards Pendor. They got there. They landed. Nothing stirred. The houses all stood empty, the dishes on the tables full of a hundred years' dust. The bones of the old sea lord and his men lay about in the castle courts and on the stairs, and the tower rooms reeked of dragon, but there was no dragon and no treasure, not a diamond the size of a poppy seed, not a single silver bead. Knowing that he couldn't stand up to seven mages, the dragon had skipped out. They tracked him, and found he'd flown to a deserted island up north called Udrath. 
They followed his trail there, and what did they find? Bones again. His bones, the dragon's, but no treasure. A wizard, some unknown wizard from somewhere, must have met him single-handed and defeated him, and then made off with the treasure right under the league's nose. The fisherman listened, attentive and expressionless. Now, that must have been a powerful wizard and a clever one, first to kill a dragon and second to get off without leaving a trace. The lords and mages of the archipelago couldn't track him at all, neither where he'd come from nor where he'd made off to. They were about to give up. That was last spring. I'd been off on a three-year voyage up in the North Reach and got back about that time. They asked me to help them find the unknown wizard. That was clever of them, because I'm not only a wizard myself, as I think some of the oafs here have guessed, but I'm also a descendant of the lords of Pendor. That treasure is mine. It's mine and knows that it's mine. Those fools of the League couldn't find it because it's not theirs. It belongs to the House of Pendor and the Great Emerald, the Star of the Horde. Yenalkul the Greenstone knows its master. Behold! Blackbeard raised his oaken staff and cried aloud, Enal kill. The tip of the staff began to glow green, a fiery green radiance, a dazzling haze the color of April grass, and at the same moment the staff tipped in the wizard's hand, leaning, slanting, till it pointed straight at the side of the hill above them. It wasn't so bright a glow, far away in Havnor, Blackbeard murmured, but the staff pointed true, in all kill answered when I called. The jewel knows its master, and I know the thief, and I shall conquer him. He's a mighty wizard who could overcome a dragon, but I am mightier. Do you know why, Oaf? Because I know his name. As Blackbeard's tone got more arrogant, Bert had looked duller and duller, blanker and blanker. But at this he gave a twitch, shut his mouth, and stared at the archipelagon. Ha! How did you learn it? he asked very slowly. Blackbeard grinned and did not answer. Black magic? How else? Bert looked pale and said nothing. I am the Sea Lord of Pendor, Oaf, and I will have the gold my father's won, and the jewels my mother's wore, and the green stone, for they are mine. Now, you can tell your village boobies the whole story after I have defeated this wizard and gone. Wait here, or you can come and watch if you're not afraid. You'll never get the chance again to see a great wizard in all his power. Blackbeard turned and, without a backward glance, strode off up the hill towards the entrance to the cave. Very slowly, Bert followed. A good distance from the cave he stepped, sat down under a hawthorn tree, and watched. The archipelagon had stopped, a stiff, dark figure alone on the green swell of the hill before the gaping cave mouth. He stood perfectly still. All at once he swung up his staff over his head, and the emerald radiance shone about him as he shouted, Thief! Thief of the horde of Pendor! Come forth! There was a crash, as of dropped crockery from inside the cave, and a lot of dust came spewing out. Scared, Bert ducked. When he looked again, he saw Blackbeard still standing motionless, and at the mouth of the cave, dusty and disheveled, stood Mr. Underhill. He looked small and pitiful, with his toes turned in as usual, and his little bow legs in black tights and no staff. He never had one, Bert suddenly thought. Mr. Underhill spoke. "'Who are you?' he said in his husky little voice. "'I am the Sea Lord of Pendor, thief,' Come to claim my treasure. At that, Mr. Underhill slowly turned pink, as he always did when people were rude to him. But then he turned something else. He turned yellow. His hair bristled out. He gave a coughing roar. And was a yellow lion leaping down the hill at Blackbeard, white fangs gleaming. 
But Blackbeard no longer stood there. A gigantic tiger, color of night and lightning, bounded to meet the lion. The lion was gone. Below the cave, all of a sudden, stood a high grove of trees, black in the winter sunshine. The tiger, checking himself in mid-leap just before he entered the shadow of the trees, caught fire in the air, became a tongue of flame lashing out at the dry black branches. But where the trees stood, a sudden cataract leapt from the hillside, an arch of silvery crashing water thundering down upon the fire. But the fire was gone, for just a moment before the fisherman's staring eyes two hills rose, the green one he knew, and a new one, a bare brown hillock, ready to drink up the rushing waterfall. That passed so quickly it made Bert blink, and after blinking he blinked again and moaned, for what he saw now was a great deal worse. Where the cataract had been there hovered a dragon. Black wings darkened all the hill, steel claws reached groping, and from the dark, scaly, gaping lips, fire and steam shot out. Beneath the monstrous creature stood Blackbeard, laughing. "'Take any shape you please, Mr. Underhill,' he taunted. "'I can match you, but the game grows tiresome. I want to look upon my treasure, upon a Nalkill. Now, big dragon, little wizard, take your true shape. I command you by the power of your true name, Yevod. Bert could not move at all, even to blink. He cowered, staring, whether he would or not. He saw the black dragon hang there in the air above black beard. He saw the fire lick many tongues from the scaly mouth, the steam jet from the red nostrils. He saw Blackbeard's face grow white, white as chalk, and the beard-fringed lips trembling. "'Your name is Yevod?' "'Yes,' said a great, husky, hissing voice. "'My true name is Yevod, and my true shape is this shape.' "'But—' But the dragon was killed. They found dragon bones on Udrath Island. That was another dragon, said the dragon, and then stooped like a hawk, talons outstretched, and Bert shut his eyes. When he opened them, the sky was clear, the hillside empty except for a reddish, blackish, trampled spot, and a few talon marks in the grass. Bert the fisherman got to his feet and ran. He ran across the common, scattering sheep to right and left, and straight down the village street to Polani's father's house. Polani was out in the garden, weeding the nasturtiums. Come with me, Bert gasped. She stared. He grabbed her wrist and dragged her with him. She screeched a little, but did not resist. He ran with her straight to the pier, pushed her into his fishing sloop, the Queenie, untied the painter, took up the oars, and set off rowing like a demon. The last that Saturn's island saw of him and Palani was the Queenie's sail vanishing in the direction of the nearest island westward. The villagers thought they would never stop talking about it, how Goody Gould's nephew Bert had lost his mind and sailed off with the schoolmistress on the very same day that the peddler Blackbeard disappeared without a trace, leaving all his feathers and beads behind. But they did stop talking about it three days later. They had other things to talk about when Mr. Underhill finally came out of his cave. Mr. Underhill had decided that since his true name was no longer a secret, he might as well drop his disguise. Walking was a lot harder than flying, and besides, it was a long, long time since he had had a real meal. The End There is a light-hearted, storybook quality to this tale that I really enjoy. Ursula Le Guin is, is one of the foremost writers of our time, and if you haven't read the Earthsea novels, uh, do it. I think that they're a little bit too long for us to read on the channel, but as I was perusing and choosing what we might 
listen to, I stumbled across this story in a collection, and I'd never read it before, so I thought it was the perfect thing to share with all of you, who also may not have read it. It is in my compiled Books of Earthsea collection towards the very back, but I found it instead in a Masterpieces of Fantasy and Enchantment collection from the late 80s, edited by David G. Hartwell. In any case, this is a big week for me, so if you are in Indiana, why don't you come out to the Grunwald Gallery on January 13th? I'm a part of a panel discussion about underwater Golden Age comic books at 5 p.m. I've got original art in the show, and, well, it ought to be a good one. This month we'll have, well, this this quarter, I suppose, we'll have a lot of things going on, including, including the Kickstarter for the next volume of Thrilling Suspense Fantasy, which diligently your host has been working on since the publication of the last one. So, whether you pick up your copies during the Kickstarter, or whether you pick them up via the link in the description box below, know that your support is how I continue to read these stories to you. All right, Happy New Year, and I will talk to you next week.